What's up, Wildcatters? Welcome back to another episode. We got our boy Will with Presidio Petroleum here. What's up, man? Hey, guys. Down for Fort Worth? Good to be here. What are you doing, Sam? Recording a podcast with you guys. Oh, shit. Come on. <laughs> I thought there was something more important than this here. I don't know. It's like, came down here to do this. What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> man, he's telling, uh, he's telling me about the new Escalade has self-driving on it. I didn't know that, so now I'm tempted. I'm in the market for a new car, so I'm like, man. Those trips to you put spinners on it. I'm here. I I murdered it out a bit. So it's okay. Got black wheels, Hell heavy yeah. tint. Ooh, uh, gangster. Yeah. Though I feel <laughs> I don't know. I was feeling pretty gangster until I stayed at the Post Oak Hotel last night, and uh, the cars parked out front there. You're like yeah, I immediately sick. feel poor. <laughs> there was actually a car that was like a. I was denied entry to post. They would not let me. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, "Sorry, you're too poor to enter." Yeah. Uh, I was dressed like I was wearing like chino shorts, kind of like you, and had yeah. a collared shirt. And they're like, "You can't no come go. in here dressed like that." And I was like, "Dude, this is fucking nice for me. What are you talking about?" And they had like. The full on urban assault vehicle from like Fast and the Furious parked out front this morning. Oh, like, did they really? The rock drives and Fast Five. <laughs> yeah. Who just drives <laughs> it around? It's like their daily driver. Like, that's yeah, I'm just going to hop up in this thing. That's definitely got to be Tillman's. It's just out there flexing it, probably. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about uh, about the company. I mean, it sounds like uh, you guys, EMP, is that the model? Yeah. So uh, the quick synopsis is people, other operators have spent more than $5 billion developing, acquiring the properties that we've bought for pennies on the dollar over the last four years. And, you know, when we started the company about five years ago, we were looking at the market and seeing how much people were paying for acreage in the middle and the Delaware basins and how open the equity market was to funding those acreage purchases yeah. with issuing equity. And we knew that uh, the industry has been historically terrible at allocating capital. And we assumed that there should be no change to that. Uh, and particularly if people are just being given unlimited amounts of money. And as a result, we thought that we were going to tip over the supply demand imbalance and have more supply than we know what to do with on the oil side and all the associated gas that was coming out was going to crush gas prices. And so we positioned ourselves exactly in the opposite direction from that. Okay. Uh, and, you know, there was obviously no way of us having been able to predict something like COVID happening, but that just added, you know, another wrinkle to the story. But what we've gone and done is we went and acquired PDP assets from generally distressed buyers or people who spent a lot of money chasing the drill bit and mm -hmm. had it focused on operations. We've, you know, gone long the physical and we've also significantly enhanced the value of the physical by cutting operating costs by up to 70% on the stuff that we buy. Nice. And totally rebooting the the field philosophy and and empowering our field guys and pushing decision making down as far in the organization as possible and incentivizing them to make good decisions. Uh, and at the same time, we hedged out the commodity over the kind of three year period significantly. I mean, we over hedged. I mean, we yeah. we would occasionally have to get waivers from the bank because we were busting covenants that were we were over hedging. Yeah. Uh, so we effectively shorted out the commodity. Uh, while going along the the tail, yeah. assuming that if we had an oversupply situation, the price was going to drop, we would benefit, and uh, then we would own the asset and own the physical in the long term. That's awesome. And so we we did uh, two acquisitions to begin with, one in uh, mid-2018 where we bought a small package from Mid-States Petroleum, and that was our, our first deal. Uh, and then we 10 x the company through the acquisition of Apache's Western Anadarko Basin assets in summer of 2019. Cool. And then that was, you know, we, we felt like we had kind of, uh, you know, placed our chips for the most part. And we, uh, I remember I presented at the Doug Midcon conference in November of 2019. And I basically called for the demise of the industry without knowing anything about, you know, what was going to happen with oil prices related to COVID. But yeah, we talked about the fact that uh, just on those Apache assets, for example, we, we went back and looked and, you know, we instinctually knew that people had destroyed a lot of value. And we wanted to quantify it. So we, we took uh, a thousand wells that we had perfect data on that were kind of modern horizontals uh, drilled in the Western Anadarko Basin by Anadarko, uh, by uh, Apache and other operators. And uh, I asked our engineers, listen, we've got the actual drilling complete cost for them. We've got the actual historical financials from them. And then we've got our forecast. Let's uh, see what, how these did. And so we put together a distribution and looked at what they, what they had accomplished. And just those thousand wells had generated negative six hundred million dollars of PV10 value, and I thought, okay, well, maybe we're being too 
harsh because these yeah. guys were allocating capital <laughs> when oil prices were higher and gas prices were higher. Yeah. <clears throat> so let's assume that the 2014 price collapse never happened. And so we ran flat pricing 2014 going forward, and it was negative $200 million of PV10 value. And that doesn't include any of the overhead. That doesn't include the acquisition costs. It doesn't yeah. uh, include you know, any of the other expenses that go into actually pushing 38 rigs, which is what Apache was doing. Yeah. And so that was, that was the proof kind of of the concept that we had back in 2016 and 2017 when we were trying to raise money to basic, basically deaf ears. I mean- uh, That's what I was going to ask. How was it raising capital with that thesis? Because I remember writing posts and getting a lot of hate talking about this kind of impending liquidity crunch that mm -hmm. oil and gas was going to face. And this was way before we knew COVID was going to be a thing, right? Mm -hmm. And the writing was on the wall. And then COVID was the super catalyst for it just yeah. happening, you know, overnight. Mm -hmm. So raising capital during that time, I'm sure that was uh, really tough for you guys. To yeah, it was almost impossible. Yeah, I mean, so uh, my business partner, Chris Hammock, and I planted a flag in Fort Worth in January of 2017. We hired a couple of guys uh, that we were paying out of our pocket and, uh, you know, left jobs to, to start the company. We felt uh, that the thesis was sound. And mm -hmm. it was one of those things, though, was, you know, was the market going to remain irrational longer than we were going to remain liquid? Yeah. And I mean, frankly, we were, we were getting pretty close to the end of what we were willing to put into the company. We had a, a number of great leads and good starts with people uh, that ended poorly. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I, I, you know, whatever kind of successes I have in life, I tend to attribute to taking the only option available to me. Yeah. And uh, we had formed a great relationship with guys at Morgan Stanley, and uh, they were actually were able to capable of seeing the thesis and wanted to take the contrarian bet, uh, whereas most other guys that we talked to had absolutely no interest. And the most common question that we got was, you know, this this looks great and all, but why do you guys drill? Then like the model will look really good. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys just aren't getting what we're saying. Like we, it's it's valley destruction. Yeah. Um. And so you know we thought you know, that we had, we had placed our bet and kind of called for the, uh, the demise of the industry and we we're going to sit back and then COVID accelerated everything. So, yeah, I mean, I remember on March 8th was the, when the Saudis cut the oil price, uh, by like $20 a barrel, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we were, were, our value of our hedge book, you know, went up a hundred million dollars that afternoon on that Sunday <laughs> afternoon. And, you know, I was getting calls from bankers and saying like, you know, you guys were, we're right. Like, yeah. what are you going to go do? Like, I think I'm going to go get drunk you. and float Told around you. my hot tub. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Because it was one of those things where like, you know, I, it happened, but like it, it was going to cause so much pain that I almost, you know, didn't want to be right. Yeah. Uh, That's what, yeah. I mean, you know, I had put some bets on that thesis as well and it sucked because you knew if you were right, what it meant for the industry. Sure but that doesn't change reality, right? So the reality yeah. is that the industry is overstaffed, continues to be overstaffed, uh, yeah. that there are too many companies and that historically the uh, leaders of those companies have been terrible ca capital allocators yeah. and frankly shouldn't be given the opportunity and aren't being given the opportunity to, to yeah. put capital to work you know, going forward. Yeah. But the other thing is, is he's still see some of those teams still getting recapitalized. Sure. And it's like, what the fuck is wrong with it? <laughs> yeah. With investors. Like, why, why do you allow that? But I mean, the I wanna, energy. <laughs> yeah, I want to, I want to dive in a little bit. Um, you know, one, I want to talk about how you guys go in and improve efficiency and reduce costs. But mm -hmm. before we do that, what's your background and what led up to the point of quitting your job and founding the company? Let's sure. dive into that. Yeah. Uh, so, Harvard undergrad economics. I uh, grew up in the Northeast outside of Philadelphia. Okay. Um, had a uh, kind of always was interested in energy, read the prize. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's obviously a lot that, uh, you know, it makes the world go round and also a lot of colorful entrepreneurs and characters. Uh, had always wanted to be an entrepreneur. Like when I was a kid, I, I don't know, I, uh, remember like building websites for people in the summer, but I, I like pre sold. Yeah. <laughs> you know, websites without actually knowing how to build a website. Yeah. <clears throat> and then like stayed up for true a week of an entrepreneur learned right how to code so in like, HTML. People, and, yeah. People don't realize like, you know, we're all coding 
you know, MySpace mm-hmm. layouts yeah. and shit. Yeah, like, exactly. Back then we we're all coding HTML. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I guess I always had that kind of entrepreneurial desire. Yeah. Um, but I started as an investment banker. I was a banker at UBS and the global energy group, uh, worked on a lot of great deals. And then in 2009, I went to the Atlas energy family of companies as okay. director of corporate development. And so we had a big Marcellus shale business that was public, uh, that we sold to Chevron, uh, for four and a half billion dollars. And then we had a pipeline business, Atlas pipeline partners that, uh, was a large gathering and processor in West Texas that we grew and then sold to, uh, target for seven and a half billion dollars in 2014. Okay. And then on the heels of that, uh, the entrepreneurial management team at Atlas was looking into raising their first SPAC. They've now done several. Uh, mm-hmm. And so I was kind of at a decision point between continuing along and, and participating in the, the SPACs or going and starting my own thing. So, so what, you know, what drove you to go start your own thing? Because obviously, you know, when you're involved with multi-billion dollar deals and mm-hmm. SPACs. I mean, this can be lucrative for everyone that's yeah. involved, right? So, you know, you're looking at leaving something pretty substantial in terms of uh, cash flow for you personally. Mm-hmm. Just say, hey, I want to go get kicked in the balls repeatedly trying to bootstrap mm-hmm. my company and, and start it. So yep. what was like really the driving force for you doing that? It was all the wrong reasons. I mean, it was like the typical, like, I don't want to have a boss anymore and <laughs> like that kind of bullshit. And, you know, the... The amount that I've learned, though, over the last five years has just been a total step change for me in in terms of uh, just, you know, really knowing and understanding the illusion of control and uh, understanding personal growth. And, you know, you learn a lot about yourself when you're cutting payroll out of your checking account every other Friday. (laughs) Uh, And, you know, and then when you're also putting money to work at scale that people aren't really sure if it's going to work out and if there's actually going to be a good outcome. Yeah. So did you, do, did you do, did you know that like prior to this, like a much prior to this, that you wanted to get in the EMP game or was it, you just saw the opportunity kind of develop the thesis and you're like, it was like the perfect opportunity for you to kind of go out on your own. Yeah. I mean, my thought on like why ENP is a startup as my first op- entrepreneurial adventure was. Yeah. It's like, a, that's a, like already going to get kicked in the nuts every day. Yeah. But especially as like an EMP guy, you're especially going to get kicked in the nuts. Yeah. Continually for years. It was what my experience was. So I assumed yeah. that that was like, if I had said like, oh, I'm going to go raise yeah, a, something to do Bitcoin. Like, I don't think I could have been able to yeah. attract much capital to do that. Uh, but doing something that, you know, was really my bread and butter. I mean, I did over $20 billion of transactions at Atlas. And so yeah. starting a company that was going to be a, basically an acquisitions mm-hmm. and integration focused business was something that, you know, I had significant experience doing. Yeah. So you went to Harvard. What did you go to Harvard for? Why did I go to Harvard? No, what did you go to Harvard for? What was your degree in? Uh, economics. In economics? Mm-hmm. Okay. I was hoping that you went to HBS or something and you Undergrad. got your MBA there. How, how was that? Uh, no, no grad degree. Okay. You know, the grad degree thing was, you know, I came out of school in 2005, was a banker for four years. That was when, you know, the world was imploding. Yeah. UBS got bailed out by the Swiss government. Like, you know, guys who would be sitting on the desk with me, like phone would ring on, you know, come down to the fifth floor. Uh, and, you know, the, then they'd be gone. Yeah. Um, I was hoping you went to HBS so I could ask you, I've always wanted to ask this question. I've never met like a, a founder that went to HBS. And so I want to ask you, did you learn more in HBS or did you learn more bootstrapping a company? We'd yeah. love to hear the comparisons between business school and, you know, real business school of running and operating yeah. a company and cutting uh, no payroll doubt. out of your your personal checking account. So, you know, I, one theme on this show, I mean, why, why digital walk and the only guest startups podcast got started was because we were looking at new technological innovations, mm-hmm. new startups that were coming on. And, you know, really our thesis or our tagline was that EMPs had to evolve or die. Mm-hmm. And so you look at, you know, just like operations like Apache where you bought, where you bought these assets. I mean, they're just, extremely inefficient they lose money and you looked at the industry and it's like we can't keep operating like this and so mm-hmm. how do you continue to bolt on assets and grow production without scaling your gna in a linear fashion like you have to be able to do more with less why don't you kind of dive into how you guys actually did that because it's easy to say that but it's hard to go and actually execute it. You know, how do you become a better operator than, you know, some of these top tier operators that you're buying assets from? How did you guys approach that? Yeah. So, I mean, the overarching goal that we had is to generate return on capital employed, which is measurable. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not a bullshit measure. It's a balance sheet measure. Uh, and you know, our, I think, and it continues to be our longstanding desire is to be the Berkshire Hathaway of oil and gas. Like we just want to continue to accumulate more and more wells onto our platform. We operate 3000 wells. We have 3000 non-operated wells. We want to get to 200,000 operated wells. Uh, and that's about 10% you know, market share of mm -hmm. North American PDP. Yeah. And also there's going to be a continuation of, of PDP, you know, growth as people continue to drill new it's wells. a shitload of wells. That's a lot. I thought we were talking like 300 wells. I didn't know you guys were as big as you are. Yeah. Uh, people are going to continue to destroy capital by drilling. We're happy to come and buy their assets for pennies on the dollar <laughs> uh, and actually generate real returns. Um, and so that as the kind of North star of, you know, compounding, really awesome return on capital employed over incredibly long periods of time. Uh, that's the goal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the way that we do it is through aqu acquisitions and operational efficiencies. And, yeah. And so we've, we've uh, learned a lot as we've gone along here. You know, our first deal was, you know, we had four employees when we bought our first 115 producing well package and we had the mid States had 20 guys in the field. We kept half of them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of it uh, has been instinctual about, you know, bringing to bear the lessons learned and, and creating um, first the culture around the field and then systemizing the culture. So, you know, the mid States, I remember we, we had a conference room in, in uh, Perryton, Texas, where we had, we're meeting with the 10 employees that we were keeping. And I was thinking like, what the hell am I going to say to these guys? Um, you know, we just let go half of their uh, former peers and mm -hmm. in all of the interviews that we had with them, they were all telling us how they're understaffed and how they actually need more people. Yeah. Uh, and that just didn't fit with our underwriting model and it didn't fit with our concept that instinctually people should be able to do more with, with less. Um, and so I talked to them about becoming small business owners. And so we view each one of our pumpers with his route as a small business. And a lot of these guys had no sense of even how valuable their small business was worth. Our first acquisition was $58 million. You know, we probably had uh, 10 or 15 routes on it. And so these guys were running a couple million dollar couple small million businesses. Bucks, yeah. They had no idea. Yeah. Uh, they were focused on production and that was all that they got out of, out of mid States. Um, you know, corporate was, these are your production targets. And you know, this is, this is what equates to success. Mm -hmm. Whereas we equate success with generating the world's best return on capital employed and doing it over long periods of time. Um, and so we, we kind of retooled and then realized, you know, what do these guys need in order to be able to be good small business owners? They need access to data. They need data that is um, easily digestible, that flags things for them automatically. Uh, and so we started building software. And so we have an internal, you know, uh, effort that has created tools that we use, uh, you know, as a company and, and that generate, you know, certain reports automatically and things for the guys in the field so that everybody can manage their small business mm -hmm. uh, in the best way possible. And then we're also scaling some of it to be more uh, industrial strength, I would say. You can go on and boltwell.com is our free Aries replacement tool. Um, it's, you know, available on... What is it, boltwell? Boltwell.com. Okay. Uh, and that was something like we ran into the difficulties of using Aries when we were doing all these acquisition underwrites. We wanted something that just did, did these automatically. I've never uh, heard anyone that just loves Aries. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it, no well, one it's loves integrated Aries. software. I mean, yeah. it, it's the worst. And all, all the other stuff that we run into is not customized towards our goal, which is again generating the best return on capital employed. Yeah, uh, you know, there are production management tools and other tools. A lot of stuff that's geared towards DNC because that's where the big bucks are. Uh, but there was nothing really on production management. So we've we've built all of that out internally. So when we went from those ten guys at Mid States to then uh, you know, the group that was working on the Apache assets was 150 guys, uh, of which again, we kept about half, um, you know, we needed to really have tools that were built and that, mm -hmm. that were scalable and we're constantly perfecting it, um, to, you know, make it more manageable, get our guys pumping more wells. Uh, I mean, we're truly industry leaders in pump by exception at this point because of the access to data that we have. We hear a lot of people in management presentations and things for assets we're looking at talking about shifting to pump by exception. You know, we shifted to it a year ago mm -hmm. uh, and we do it all on a value basis. So, I mean, it's our guys know which wells within your small business are the valuable ones. You should go see those every two days or every three days or maybe even every day if it's a particularly valuable one. But yeah. otherwise, 
these other wells that you don't, you know, you can go see once a month. And yeah. Uh, so it's, it's been a total mindset change for, uh, both for the guys who are in the field, the engineers who we bring in, uh, to work in Fort Worth to oversee the field. And, uh, and fr- frankly, it's, you know, we have a direct connection between Fort Worth and the field also where, you know, our, our pumpers roll up to foreman and then that's it. We don't have a field leadership structure, uh, of, you know, superintendents and senior guys. Uh, the idea is, you know, you run your own business and our engineers in Fort Worth are there to support you guys to do that. Yeah. Um, that's pretty awesome. I mean, you know, you guys are in a tough position where you go acquire this asset and you know, you have to reduce staff by half and mm-hmm. it's really hard. Like, it's nearly impossible to have high morale with the remaining team when that happens. But when you reframe it as, Hey, you actually have ownership in this and you show them how valuable they mm-hmm. are instead of, you know, you're not just a field hand that is, you know, make sure that this well stays online, but you're actually operating, you know, $3 million in, in revenue. Mm-hmm. Like, this is you doing it and we're going to give you the resources. So you're having the these, best that you can. Are these pumpers, like, are you actually having them kind of like run their own P&Ls and kind of incentivizing them based on how yep. profitable these wells are? Yeah. So we have, I mean, this is like, again, where instinctually we knew we needed to find a way to both, you know, do the, uh, empowerment, but then also tie compensation to it. Yeah. Uh, and so we started with, uh, like, and every company that, you know, I've encountered in the EMP space has always tried to figure out how do we incentivize the field guys? Like we we need to give them some special bonus or, you know, whatever it is. And I was, I thought when we first bought mid States, I was like, fuck it, let's just start giving $500 Amazon gift cards once a month to like a guy who's doing a particularly good job. Like let's not overcomplicate this. Yeah. (laughs) And, uh, you know, we, I remember my wife and I went to um, Memphis for a wedding, like, I don't know, 15 years ago. And uh, I don't know how much you guys know about Elvis, but Elvis. Uh, Not a ton. <laughs> I didn't either. <laughs> All I knew, songs, it's, it's pretty much it. I knew that he like died on the can yeah. and, you know, was kind of this, you know, big fat guy in his old age. I had no idea how uh, dynamic and interesting a person that he was kind of before he was in that yeah. end of life phase. Yeah. Uh, and so he had this rallying cry that was called TCB taking care of business. And like, he had it everywhere. He wore a necklace with it. He had it painted on the tail of his airplane, uh, his band, it was Elvis Presley and the TCB band. Yeah. Uh, and he was, he was into martial arts and like all all this, uh, he was like a really interesting guy. Yeah. Uh, but it was all driven by this TCB philosophy. So I was like, let's call this thing the TCB prize. And now it's a, it's a, Still given out monthly. We have actually a real field incentive plan now. That's a profit sharing plan for the field guys. Yeah. Uh, but the TCB is still a big deal and you'll find it around our office and murals and things, um, you know, yeah. hiding out. I love how you didn't overcomplicate it at first. Just, yeah. Just like, keep it simple. Just it made me think about mm-hmm. when I was drilling wells for RSP back in the day, they would give us a $500 Amazon gift card if we finished the well safely within two weeks and we're drilling the fuck out of those wells. We right. love those $500. Yeah, exactly. Visa great. gift cards. Like, like, yeah. Awesome. And like we, you know, we're, we've pushed the whole company out to Slack, uh, over nice. email. And so we did that, I don't know, three years ago. And so there's a, a it is so cra- like, if someone from Silicon Valley was listening to this, they'd be like, oh, this company thinks that they're high tech because they switched to Slack three years ago. Right. But in the oil and gas industry, that was unheard people of. People still haven't like, heard of pe- it. Yeah, people still aren't using that if, even with remote. If y'all are listening and you still use email for internal communications, <laughs> you're wrong. <all> right? <laughs> yeah, you're wrong. <laughs> So that's crazy. Yeah. So I mean, we, we I, I don't, the big thing now is not even the five hundred dollar gift card. It's that there's a write up that goes out on Slack on the last Friday of the month of who the you know next honoree is with the TCB award. Hell yeah. And you know there people you know submit commentary and things and like it's really great. Uh, nice. It's really cool. 
I and then, that. you know, we've also put in place this field incentive plan. So basically, you know, we look at what the profitability for the various routes and everything should be. And again, we, we kind of made this too complex and now we need to simplify it. Yeah. Uh, but to the extent that, you know, actions that the guys on the ground are taking are causing additional profit to the company, we give back yeah. uh, a portion of that and we give them the opportunity to double their annual incentive comp through the field incentive program. And That's we've, awesome. we've paid out it, you know, it's, it's calculated and, you know, we pay up probably between 80 and 90% of like max target yeah. every quarter. And our exp operating expenses are, I mean, you asked how we, you know, how we optimize and what we do. I mean, our, our operating expenses are, I think they're the lowest in the industry. I know they're uh, by far the lowest of any of the operators that have not up, that we have not up interest in. Yeah. Um, and we're about 50% less than our average non-op interest in our 3,000 wells. That's wild. And when we look at public companies, we're significantly less than them. Yeah. And it's, and it just goes down. Yeah. Like it's not, these guys are never sitting still. Um, they're inventing and they're fully armed to go and make changes and figure out, you know, what is it that is causing me time? What is it that's causing me money? And, you know, how do I, how do I fix it? We had one guy who, who, uh, brought in a automatic soap stick launcher that he started installing <laughs> on certain of his wells. And like, it was unbelievable the savings that we got out of it. And this yeah. is like, these are the pennies and nickels and dimes that we're picking up doing this. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it was pretty cool. He put together a training video on how it works and no presented it to the company at one of the uh, health and safety meetings. I thought it was so great. I showed it to our board at our next quarterly board meeting. It was just That's amazing. unbelievable the level of kind of entrepreneurialism that we've pushed just, down. Well, the just, initiative that you get from people yeah. when you have aligned incentives, right? I mm -hmm. mean, people are going to be way more willing to think outside of the box about, hey, this is my small business. How yeah. can I increase? Ownership changes that. Yeah. We had a, uh, so, you know, as if, things weren't any, you know, better for us af after the oil price collapsed uh, mm -hmm. during COVID, you know, which kind of have proven the thesis right. Uh, we then went and bought a big asset out of bankruptcy in the summer of 2020. So, at, okay. you know, Templar had gone bankrupt. They were marketing through negative oil prices. And, uh, you know, it was, I think it's probably the best private equity deal ever done. Um, and we ended up buying basically with we uh we drew down our revolver to mm -hmm. to buy it um and you know we were told you can't do that i mean this is the middle of covid <laughs> yeah. and we had some availability left and bmo was our lead bank and you know obviously they're now out of the business so i feel fine talking about this but yeah. they, uh, <clears throat> i mean they really tried uh to put the screws on us i mean they wanted to cut our borrowing base by 50 percent, and it was because we actually could pay back the loan and so they wanted to keep us in as tight a box as possible. Yeah. And so we saw the Templar opportunity. We knew that it was going to come to auction. And so we wanted to draw our liquidity. Uh, and they said no. And I'm like, well, we've got a, a contract here to, to, uh, for you guys to fund. Yeah. And I remember I got a call from the president of BMO. And he said, you know, if you draw this money, you'll, you'll never have another commercial loan again. Uh, like, we'll, you know, we'll destroy your reputation in the market. Yeah. Okay. Like give us the money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so we, we drew down and then we had some cash in our balance sheet. And then we went and bought these Templar assets at auction. Uh, and when we closed on it, it was like a $78 million deal and you know, basically funded a hundred percent with cash on balance sheet and That's debt. Awesome. And then it's worth, I don't know, $400 million today. Yeah. A year later. But I'll say you got it on, you know, pennies we, on the dollar. Yeah. We didn't know it was. Yeah. And I mean, the, the group who, I mean, that was just a recurring value destruction, like a case study. In it. I mean, you look at, uh, like what Templar did, they, you know, they went and bought assets from Forest and Newfield, and then they drilled the shit out of them. That was in conjunction with first reserve. Then they lost all of first reserves money. They restructured, they had issued some bonds that were issued to a group of New York hedge funds. Those guys, uh, converted into the equity. Uh, then they lost all of their money. And then we made an offer basically to Bank of America, who was the lead bank and said, Hey, we can probably get you guys out of this. Yeah. If you guys can give us kind of an aggressive financing on it. And you know, they, they wanted to let it run its course. Uh, and then they ended up losing 90 cents on the dollar. Jeez. So, you know, this asset alone was billions of dollars of capital destruction yeah. for a, you know, consortium of banks, hedge funds and private equity guys. Yeah. 
And it's just one example. Like yeah. I've heard thrown around that they're, you know, the hundred billion dollars of capital destruction. I think that's light. I mean, it's gotta be because we've got like 5 billion just on like our, our little situation with yeah. 3000 wells. And that was your biggest acquisition to date? No, Apache was, was bigger. Okay. Interestingly, it was probably about the same. It was a similar size to Apache, but it was a much less, much less costly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> we, we were able to buy it at, we were buying at the bottom. I mean, that yeah. was when we closed oil was 38 bucks and gas was a dollar 67. Yeah. And that was, uh, and they used to have this, uh, there was this wildcatter show on PBS, like 16 or 17 years ago. And I remember, uh, Clayton Williams talking on there he's mm -hmm. talking about when he got his start and he got his start, like there was blood in the streets and yeah. he remember, I remember him saying that everyone around him was just, you know, it was doom and gloom and everyone was talking about, you know, how the, the business was just in turmoil and he's like. He's like, this is fucking great. He's like, I'm making a ton of money. I don't mm -hmm. know about you guys. Like, this reminds me of that. Yeah. Um, so they, you know, they to the guys, the point of the guys, like we brought in the field guys from Templar, and you know, we again did kind of our our culling and hired the guys who, um, you know, yeah. you can pretty easily in those interviews tell who are the guys who kind of get it and who want to be entrepreneurs and who are interested in owning their own business yeah. and the guys who don't. Yeah. Um, it's there were very few hard decisions to make in any of that. Yeah. Um. But it was really interesting because, you know, we had their group of uh, well tenders and foremen and man, they, I mean, they just, they were so morose and like, you know, the morale was down and everything. And it was mm -hmm. like, listen, I, we, you should have seen the Apache guys a year ago and it was the same thing. But now these yeah. guys are your, they're your older Presidio brothers. They've been here. Yeah. Uh, just, pr you know, trust the system, trust the process. You guys are going to, you know, you're going to do more and, and better things than, you know, you've been allowed to do. Uh, or maybe you used to be allowed to do and haven't been for a long time. We're going to get you back to that. Yeah. Um, and so it turns around pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this whole story is pretty exciting to me because I spend so much time thinking about culture and it's something that the industry has uh, historically ignored. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people talk about having great culture, but we know how EMPs, uh, OFS, everyone in the industry, like you're a number. When commodity prices go down, you're at significant risk of losing your job. We don't give a shit and there's no ownership. There's no initiative to go, Hey, go figure out things. Hey, mm -hmm. you have the freedom and the ability to go find an automatic, you know, soap stick launcher mm -hmm. and use it. And Hey, if it starts working, we're going to deploy it throughout the company. Like giving people ownership and responsibility is powerful because if all decisions are flowing up to upper management, which also I love how you guys kind of have a flat organizational structure. Like every field supervisor or superintendent I've met, it's just worthless, right? So it's like, hey, let's just remove that barrier. Mm -hmm. And you have people at the bottom making decisions and taking initiative. That's how you grow as a company. Yep. So you can't have everything, you know, coming up to yeah. Why you would you want to make? Why would you want to make? Have you decisions that have to come up to me is a failure of the system. Yeah. So like yeah. we we want to make as few decisions as as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, how many people do y'all have at the company now? Field, you know, field personnel, engineers in the office. Mm -hmm. We've how, got 150. 150. Yep. Have there been any challenges of, you know, scaling that team and keeping that culture intact? Or Especially with these been, acquisitions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah, that's what I'm interested in. You know, you're taking different teams that have old mm -hmm. habits, old cultures, and then mashing them together. How's that been? We've done it really well. I mean, it's, it's been something that like we're culture first. Yeah. So, you know, when you lead with that, you know, you don't really give and, and when you're kind of key people who are running the integration or bought in on that, yeah. uh, that it's culture first, uh, it kind of at first is a, you're either on board or, you know, you're either going to get it or you're gone. Yeah. Um, when you're scaling up significantly and, you know, we had some people who left after, you know, thinking that they were going to be on the program, but then turned out that they actually didn't want to be on it and they didn't, you know, they just wanted to pump their route and then go home. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, we had a lot of people though, who became super bought into it. That's awesome. Uh, and so as we've now, you know, we, the inflection point for us was the 10 X from mid States to Apache and getting through that, uh, was critical because then, you know, anything else we do, like when we bought Templar, we doubled the size of the company again. Uh, but, we had all the guys from Apache who were there. Like I said, they were the Presidio older brothers. So like they, they were there to help mentor the new guys, bring them along. Uh, 
and so as we've you know built it now, it's it's very it's sustainable and it's scalable. Yeah. Um, everything we've wanted to do since day one has always been about you know making it scalable because you can't go operate two hundred thousand wells if you don't have the systems in place to go yeah absolutely. and scale quickly. Absolutely. So that's why we've had the investment in tech. That's why we've had the investment in culture. Yeah. Uh, because those are the things that uh, if you can get those right. Uh, you can scale the assets actually pretty easily. Does the TCB program or something sort of like that kind of extend to the engineers in the office? It doesn't. Uh, That's awesome. I love hearing that as a field hand. Fuck yeah. them engineers. <laughs> <laughs> Just fine, you guys. Know, we've had, <laughs> I think there's some interest in our Fort Worth employee base of having an equivalent program, but, uh, you know, our, our field guys are really special. And, yeah. you know, they are living a totally different life than our our people in Fort Worth are living yeah. and uh, I think we need to respect that and give them, you know, oh, man, something that, that's unique. You're going to be, you're going to have a, your inbox is going to be swamped with field guys <laughs> wanting, to, <laughs> wanting, to, wanting to apply from here on out. No, that's what, that's what's special to me about hearing this. I come from a field background mm -hmm. and I know what it's like to, you know, no one gives a shit about you out there. You're mm -hmm. just, you know, you're a field hand. And so it's like, why would you take initiative to do things better? And then all of a sudden, companies like hey you're this valuable and we want to reward you for you know creating even more value it's completely flips the script mm -hmm. and so that's a uh, really unique so on this podcast it's really funny because we have extremely intelligent people come on here you know data scientists engineers geophysicists that have you know created badass technologies but our top downloaded podcasts are always from me and p guys <laughs> so people are always just you know, there's just kind of this, uh, they're, they're just this curiosity of creating an EMP. Like people are fascinated by it. Or they're masochistic or something. Yeah. That's, that's kind of how I, <laughs> that's how I think of it. That's like, I was on a phone call with someone yesterday and he told me, he's like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm 25% uh, working interest owner and about 1300 wells. I was like, mm -hmm. I'm sorry to hear that. That <laughs> sounds terrible. Um, but you know, there's a lot of people that are listening that are interested in starting an EMP. Mm-hmm. What advice do you have to those types of people that are interested? Like, I, I know I have several buddies that are slowly building up production. You know, they're, they're pumpers and, you know, they're picking up 10 wells here, 10 wells there. It's inspiring. And yeah, it yeah. is. And like, they started doing it last year, you know, mm -hmm. in the, in the thick of things with COVID. Do you have any advice for those types of people that want to start an EMP or are currently building production? Um, you know, kind of lessons learned from your journey. Yeah. You have to have a thesis. I mean, so that's, to me, that's always, that's number one. I mean, it comes, you know, even before culture and figuring out all that stuff and, you know, what it is that, you know, it's even, it's even more than, uh, than kind of what you want to do. It's, it's who you want to be. And so that's the that North star that you were talking about. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, that's like Arnold's like, uh, you know, famous graduation speech when mm -hmm. he says like, you know, figure out who you want to be, not what. Uh, yeah. and so you have to have that thesis and I mean, the thesis can be anything. I mean, part of what I've often criticized the EMP, uh, space for is lack of thesis. I mean, they're particularly the public guys are just so whipsawed by public investors and public sentiment. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if you just look at like the chronology, you know, we had the 2014 collapse in pricing and, you know, investors said, okay, you know, no more. Uh, no more drilling. And then it was like, okay, prices recovered. Okay. Now, you know, we're going to give you money to drill and buy acreage, but like, you have to be very efficient with it. And then it was okay. So then all the companies went like vertically integrated services and things. And then it was like, actually, no, you need to cut GNA. Like you can't have this bloated GNA structures. So then they got rid of the vertical integration and, you know, tried to close offices and, and lean out and, you know, you're just going through up and down. Now we want you to drill more. And now we want you to grow production. Now we want you to just be free cash flow positive. And the industry just says, oh, you know, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, without actually having a thesis of their own. Like yeah. the thesis should be, how do I operate my business to grow long-term value that when investors see that, that it's repeatable and that it happens over time, they come in. Not that, you know, the investors are telling me this year I have to be free cash flow positive. And so you know, I'm going to be focused on free cash flow. You know, my, my joke on the free cash flow positive thing is, uh, or drilling within cash flow is now they're just destroying value more slowly. Mm -hmm. It used to be, you know, all this mm -hmm. outside capital coming in and now, you know, it's, it's, yeah. uh, just, just their own. Now it's just your own money. You're destroying. Just a slow burn. Now. Uh, it's yeah. a slow burn. <laughs> <clears throat> but 
so your thesis can be whatever you want it to be, mm -hmm. um, but you have to have one. And, yeah. you know, in our case, the thesis was we want to be contrarian and we want to, uh, and that, that meant several things to us. It meant buying assets that were different than the assets that everybody else was buying. It meant going in and operating them in a way that's significantly different than the way anybody had operated assets before. Uh, and then it also meant um, bringing in the tech component and saying, you know, this is an industry that's generally dead from a technology perspective. Let's, let's, you know, the, the, you know, I always equated it to other industries have done such a good job of blending tech and energy. So, you know, you look at uh, tech and, and their industry. So like Uber, like is Uber a ride sharing business or a technology business? Mm -hmm. Even like Target has done an incredible job rebooting themselves. Are they a retailer or a tech business? You know, yeah. like, you know, shop through the phone while you're in the store, do, like playing these games and stuff. Like it's every company they've done an incredible tech, job. Every company is a tech company. That's right. And, and, and that's that actually something that we say on our website. Every company oh, really? Is a tech company. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And, but, I mean, that's but how nobody I yeah. confuses an oil and gas company for a tech company. Yeah. <laughs> like there's no blurred line. Like there's. You're not, um, you're definitely not getting the tech multiples in public <laughs> equity. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yes. <laughs> and so that was part of, we wanted to blur the, try to blur the lines and start to figure out how do we, you know, make oil and gas more tech forward. And that was a part of the thesis. And then the last piece of it was because we were doing something that was kind of a new business model, we needed to find a new way of financing it. Uh, mm -hmm. and so, you know, we worked over a multi-year period to, uh, create a new type of, uh, energy financing, which are these, uh, energy ABS. Uh, we just issued a few weeks ago, the, the largest energy ABS uh, yep. by multiples. It's got two investment grade tranches. Uh, and it was a number of firsts, but one of the ones that we're really excited about is that it's the first upstream business that was given a sustainability linked bond rating yeah uh from a third party so it's from moody's kind of so for those who are not finance gurus explain that like like they're five yeah so we issued uh bonds that are backed by the value of our assets but we designed them so that they match the profile of the assets so mm -hmm. pdp declines mm -hmm. uh so it's like think of it like a home mortgage like you have principal and interest payments and, you know, we make principal and interest payments that are scaled to the asset profile and how the cash flows are going to generate over the next, you know, five to seven years. Um, and investors are willing to give you, you know, significant upfront sums in exchange for uh, an interest rate. Mm -hmm. I think the, uh, the key component to making that work was being able to get credit ratings mm -hmm. so that they could be, you know, institutional grade bonds and so that you can make that work. Yep. I remember when I started seeing the securitization of assets, I thought that was really interesting mm -hmm. that someone had convinced um, third parties to give you know, credit ratings to those products. Yeah. So, yeah, we had two investment grade ratings from Fitch on our, our two investment grade tranches. Yeah. And then we sold one sub investment grade tranche that had a higher interest rate. That's awesome. Um, but that, that was also a part of the thesis was it was kind of this soup to nuts, like let's go do a totally new business. Let's empower it with tech. Let's, also have a really kick-ass culture and then let's figure out how to finance this thing with, you know, long-term capital from yeah. the, the guys who this eventually should flow to, which are your lowest cost of capital providers, insurance companies, pension funds, uh, because oil and gas is not going away. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be here. Even, you know, you look at the IAs targeted net zero by 2050 and that calls for no new drilling. Um, but there's still the need to operate millions of, of producing wells yeah. uh, around the world. Yeah. Uh, and so you need companies that are best in class at doing that. They can do it efficiently. They can do it safely. They can do it in an environmentally friendly way. Yeah. And I mean, the way that we achieved our sustainability linked bond rating was we committed to reduce the uh, greenhouse gas scope one, scope two emissions by 50% on assets that we buy. Oh, nice. And that's, that's awesome. a project that, you know, frankly is a, is a no brainer. Like we, yeah. We should be doing it anyway. Yeah. I mean, we should be good stewards of the environment. And if it can be produced with zero emissions, why not? Yeah. Yep. So, man, this conversation is really exciting to me. Um, you know, we always looked at Rice Brothers and Rice Energy as kind of, you know, they're the epitome. They're embodied what we preach here at Digital Wildcatters, which is evolve or die. Mm -hmm. And to see you guys go and execute with the same type of thesis that we've thought how oil and gas should operate 
it's awesome to see because four or five years ago when we were talking about it, everyone this was a pipe dream. Yeah. Everyone <laughs> like, what the fuck are you talking about? So it's awesome to see people in the space actually go out and execute on it and make it happen. And, um, you know, before we end this, we'd love to ask you, what's your goal for the company mm -hmm. over, you know, next 10 years? I mean, are you guys looking to you know keep growing and, you know, eventually be acquired, sell out? You guys want to become, you know, you have lofty goals, become the largest independent uh, producer do you in, go public? in the States. Like, what do you, mm -hmm. what y'all's plan? Yeah. Do you ever plan on IPO, doing an IPO and going yeah. public? I mean, I, I threw it, threw it out there, I don't know, six months or so ago about our goal to operate 200,000 wells in the country. And uh, frankly, I mean, I, that may be selling ourselves short. It's awesome. uh, I mean, the, all of this production needs to flow uh, to a small group of operators particularly if we're not going to have additional drilling, which, I mean, the additional drilling may be governed by desires to get to net zero. It may also be governed by the fact that uh, the U.S. plates are pretty drilled up. I mean, there's there's not a lot of inventory left. In I was having a conversation about that the other day. I was like, man, we just don't have a lot of tier one rock left. Right. I mean, now as, as commodity prices go up, you know, do you start to unlock the tier two, tier yeah. three? Maybe, but then I think you're you're going to see situations of additional capital destruction again, where we're kind of back in this vicious <laughs> yeah. cycle where yeah. like commodity prices go up. So people go drill tier two plays, they destroy a bunch of money. And then somebody like me comes in and buys it for 10 cents on the dollar. Um, so it's, uh, the goal is to be significantly bigger, to go from our, you know, 3000 wells to 200,000. That's the next logical step. We wanted to 10 X the business. Uh, I moved down from New York city. When I started the business, I was living in New York city and I, I moved to Fort worth with the idea of 10 X in the business. And we did it six months later with the Apache acquisition. Oh, and yeah. then we said, we want to 10 X it again. We've doubled it again since then. Uh, so we still have some work to do to get to that, that 10 X, yeah. uh, but we're going to get there. And you know, the, it, the question of how to finance it, it could be through the public markets. It could continue to be through the private markets. Uh, certainly we're going to finance it with, uh, the new securitization technology that we've spent the last four years developing, uh, with Guggenheim. And, uh, I think, you know, really the, the sky's the limit. That's awesome, man. You know, I think that, um, over the next decade, I've been preaching this message, like you, you kind of touched on it, talking about oil's not going away, but if you look at oil demand over the next 20, 30 years, mm -hmm. obviously the industry is going to look different, right? And you're going to have a, sh a shrinkage in the workforce, which we've already had that contraction. Mm -hmm. There's so much opportunity over the next, I don't know, 10, 20 years for people who are willing to you know, get dirty and get in the trenches and find that niche and they have a thesis and go execute on that thesis. So it's, um, you know, I think this is one of those stories where you can point towards and say, hey, look, all the negative sentiment that's been around oil and gas for the last you know few years there's still a lot of opportunity to go make something happen so yep and i think people just need to do it in the right way i mean i i attribute the fact that we've been able to do what we've been able to do because of the people that we've been able to attract and the people we've been able to retain mm -hmm. and the way that we've treated them um yeah and you know there is so much noise and so much going on in the world that uh you know to to really empower people to, to feel like, you know, they, they can be free to, to think the way they want and make decisions the way they want and work the way that they want to. I mean, that's, that's, uh, really the source of kind of everything that we do. hundred percent. Well, thanks for coming on the show. Man. Yeah. This is great. Coming down to yeah. Houston. No, this glad is, to uh, do it. Yeah. Like I said, this, this will be one of the top downloaded episodes. So people will definitely, Perfect. uh, you're, you're probably going to get some messages either. People like, Hey, I want to come be a, <laughs> great. Come pump some wells for you. <laughs> come welcome. <laughs> yeah. So there you have it guys. You can make money as an EMP in 2021. So that's super awesome. Thanks again, Will, for coming down. Um, I want everybody to go troll Colin. His beard's getting really long. So just go at Frack Slap. Let him know. We need to trim this beard. <laughs> also check out our newsletter, the BDE newsletter, big digital energy newsletter on the website. Send it out every single Monday. All your energy news in your inbox once a week. Catch you guys next time.